everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself. Shalom everyone, Natan Lawrence here, Hoshana Rabbah, Biblical Discipleship Resources, welcoming you to another edition of Waters in the Wilderness. Today we're going to take another look at the Tabernacle of Moses. I'm doing a series of videos on this subject. And really the Tabernacle of Moses is like a diamond. It is a very simple structure when you look at it. But it really is like a diamond with many facets. And each diamond, I'm not a jeweler, but diamonds have their own unique personalities and experts are able to look at them and see the unique characteristics of each diamond. And by turning the diamond and looking at its various facets and looking into it, maybe with a magnifying glass or something like that, you can see the unique qualities. Well, we're looking at the tabernacle from various viewpoints. Because the tabernacle is, like I said, a very simple structure, but contained within that structure is literally um, a mysterious um, message. It's, it's encoded in, in, in all aspects of the tabernacle, from the way it was constructed to the materials that were used, the, um, um, all the ceremonies that went on there, the rituals, uh, the, the the officiants there at the, at the, in the tabernacle, the priests and the Levites, and everything that went on, there is a coded message. And when you begin to decode this message and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, uh, it is an incredible story. And it's literally the story of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we're going to talk about that today. It's a story of the plan of salvation. It's a story of, man, of Elohim's attempt to redeem man from the fall, from sin, from, from a state of rebellion and separation from Elohim. And so this is an incredible story. Now I don't claim to have all the knowledge on the tabernacle. I really believe, even though I've been studying it for many years and teaching about it, I believe that my understanding is actually very elementary. Um, I have barely scratched the surface. And other people have other understandings and there's so much more. But what I have, I give, and if hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. And today, we're going to talk about, uh, the title is, The Bible is a story of the reconciliation between two lovers. Reconciliation between two lovers. And the tabernacle contains the outline of that story. You know, love and romance has captured the attention and the imagination of men uh, since time immemorial. And today we see in our society, no exception, we see this fascination with uh, love and romance. It's evidenced in the music, the movies, the literature, and numerous other ways, including man's, uh, modern man's obsession with sexuality, and even sadly with illicit and perverse sexual lifestyles and, you know, a perverse twist on something that Elohim made that was really good and a blessing. And we see uh, the proliferation of things like pornography. Um, but that was not the Creator's original intent. That is a perversion of, or a counterfeit or perversion of, of, of something that otherwise is very good. And the creator of the universe is the, the Holy One of Israel, the author of the scriptures, Yehovah Elohim is his name, is also captivated by love and romance. Uh, he, after all, he was the creator uh, of marriage and sex. In fact, the very first command that he gave to Adam and Eve, the very first one in Genesis 1.28 was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with their offspring. Well, obviously, to accomplish this involves sexual relations in a marriage. So he created marriage, one man, one woman, together, and they would then produce children. So the writer of Hebrews 
uh, in the epistle to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 13.4 that marriage is honorable and the marriage bed is undefiled. And then it goes on to say that sexual, uh, uh, sexual perverse, whoremonger, whoremongers and fornicators Elohim will judge. So here we see the 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 antithesis, the thesis and antithesis, the the the, the truth of the purity and the beauty of, beauty of sexual relations in marriage, compared or juxtaposed to the uh, perverse, illicit um, uh, sexual involvements uh, that 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 degenerate, depraved, uh, sinful, rebellious human beings, uh, lustful human beings fall into, unfortunately. But interestingly enough, much of the Bible itself is devoted to the subject of love and marriage. Not just a few isolated little um, places here and there, but there's a lot. Uh, the Bible speaks a lot about it. Um, and we see that love and marriage at a human level is merely a foreshadow of something much deeper. It's a, it's a picture of uh, love and marriage at a spiritual level. You all know John 3.16, perhaps the most popular, uh, most well-known verse in the Bible in Christianity. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever should believe on Him, that's Yeshua, should, have etern should not perish, but have e everlasting or eternal life. Most of you can probably quote it from memory. Um, and so, you know, this, this verse, John 3.16, talks about a love, and I'm going to show you, actually a romance that is at a higher level than a physical romance between a man and, a, and his wife. And so this verse, I believe, alludes to a higher, to a love and romance at a higher spiritual level, which as we will see as we go along, is simply, the, the love and romance between people is simply a foreshadow or a prophetic um, example of love at a higher spiritual level. Now, most people understand, uh, understand that poetry and poetic prose and music is the language of, of love. Yet, very few realize that much of the scripture is poetry and, or poetic prose and is even music. And, and this is a beautiful thing when you stop and think about it. It's, it's music in a Hebraic style. It's music in a Hebraic style. Uh, so much of this, unfortunately, much of this, much of the poetic style is lost in the translation from Hebrew in, into other languages like English. But if you go back into the Hebrew, <clears throat> you will see that um, that the books of most, a lot of the books of the writings, the ne the uh, Ketuvim, the Psalms, for example, Proverbs, Job, and the Song of Solomon and Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, are 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 actually. Uh, poems, Hebrew poetry, or or high poetic prose, using uh, using um, um, device literary devices, uh, poetic devices in order to to uh, to tell their story, and we also see that many of the Hebrew prophets wrote in a poetic style. In fact, much much of the prophecy or the the, the Nevi'im part of the Tanakh or the Old Testament is is poetic and written in prose style. Moreover, moreover, we see that even in the in the New Testament, the testimony of Yeshua, we see the agadic style of literature, which is a Hebrew genre of literature. Um, we find this in the parables of Yeshua. Agadic literature is story, is literature, a poetic literature that that it, it encompasses or uses stories. To tell, to convey spiritual truths, or or to convey um, lessons or morals, kind of like some of the fables we know, Aesop's fables, and this kind of thing. Now, perhaps the greatest love story that was ever written, certainly to be found in the scriptures, but by some accounts, maybe the greatest poem that has ever been written in the history of the world is the Song of Solomon. Now this poem is a tender and romantic love story about the great love of a, of a man between between a man and his bride. Now many 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 uh, Bible believers believe that this is an allegory that this that this uh, Song of Solomon can be taken as an allegory about expressing the love between Yeshua and his bride. 
um, Israel, or the redeemed, what we might call redeemed Israel, and the body of believers called the saints. In fact, in Ephesians 5, 21-33, Paul carries this, this marriage theme to the next level, where he writes that the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife is should be is similar or like a picture or a shadow of the um, the relationship that exists between Yeshua and his body of believers, uh, the saints, and and then he goes on to say in verse thirty two that this this um, is a mystery, how marriage is a picture of of the, the relationship between Yeshua and the saints. This is a mystery. But he says, but I speak concerning Messiah and the church. And the word mystery here is the Greek word mysterion, where we get the word mystery from in, in the English language. It literally means a secret or hidden things relating to the deep and wise counsel of Yehovah, which is hidden to ordinary individuals and revealed only to a select or special group of people, in this case, the saints. So taking the idea of Yeshua and the bride the saints to its highest level. John, the Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9, he talks prophetically in verse 9 about the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's Yeshua, the Lamb. And he says in verse 7 and 8 that the marriage has come and the wife, that is the saints, who have the testimony of Yeshua, who have the gospel message, believe in and have faith in Yeshua, the Messiah, and keep His commandments, His commandments, His Torah commandments. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh, John 14, 15, in the book of Luke, he he uses the term commandments and he relates it to the 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 Torah, the the Shema, which is the cornerstone or the uh, overview or a summation of the Torah. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And the Torah, the law of Moses, shows us how to do that. So the the saints who are preparing themselves to marry Yeshua are those who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep His commandments. And it says, it says in Revelation um, 19, 7 and 8 that this bride has made herself ready by putting on the clean and white wedding garments, which is the righteousness of the saints, or the righteous deeds of the saints, as some translations render this. So what are the righteous deeds of the saints? Well, love me and keep my commandments would be a good start. Uh, 1 John Two, it says, whoever, whoever says he knows God and does not keep his commandments is a liar and his truth is not in him. And Psalm 119, 172 says, all thy commandments, all thy Torah laws, all thy commandments are righteousness. So, uh, it says that these saints will rule and reign with Yeshua the Messiah forever and ever in his kingdom when he returns to the earth. This is what we, we know to be the case from the book of Revelation and elsewhere. So, this is who these saints are. They are Torah obedient. They love Yeshua and keep His commandments. And, and, um, and this is a bride. She is a bride who is getting herself ready to marry her Jewish Rabbi Messiah bridegroom. Now, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, on several occasions, Yeshua, the Messiah, alludes to his upcoming marriage to a spiritual bride, and it does so in typical uh, Hebraic fashion, again, known as Agadic literature, uh, telling stories to illustrate spiritual truths. And in this we see, for example, in the parable of the ten virgins, or the parable of the wedding banquet. Um, Matthew 25, 1 through 13, and the wedding banquets in Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Not to mention the prophetic allegorical implications of his first miracle, the turning of the water into wine there at Canaan of Galilee. Galilee, Galilee. Um, and, and, and the wedding implications, the prophetic implications of that, uh, of that, um, of that miracle are amazing and, and thankfully has not been lost uh, by uh, by many Christian commentators. So, this upcoming marriage forms an essential aspect of the good news or the gospel message of the kingdom of heaven. And so Yeshua came to prepare his bride for his for this wedding. And the message that he had for his bride was the summation of the gospel is repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see that in Luke uh, in Matthew 3, where John the Baptist preached the message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when Yeshua in Matthew chapter 4 came out of the wilderness, the wilderness temptation and overcame the evil one, the Satan there, the devil, he then went out to preach the message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well now repent of what? Well repent of sin. What is sin? Sin is a violation of the Torah, the violation of the law of God. 1 John 3, 4. And so the bride would be repenting of sin, putting away sin, coming out of sinful uh, lifestyle, sinful habits, sinful thought patterns, sinful words, coming out of uh, sinful relationships, and coming into a relationship with Yeshua uh, through the Holy Spirit. And and the word of Elohim by obeying it. And not only that, but Yeshua preached the message of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is that time uh, when Yeshua's kingdom will be fully and universally established on this earth at His second coming, where He marries His bride, the spiritual body of saints who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep His commandments, and who Paul refers to in Ephesians 2, 11-16 as the one new man, or what we might call redeemed Israel, those that have put their faith in Yeshua, been washed by His blood, washed of their sins, and are now walking in righteousness, righteous obedience, uh, obeying His commandments, and as it says in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, the righteous robes of the saints, or the, the white garments of the saints, are the righteous deeds of the saints. So, um, the reward of the righteous will be to rule and reign with Yeshua as His bride in His eternal kingdom. So, uh, we see that that um, at this marriage, the marriage of Yeshua and His bride at His second coming, redeemed Israel will exchange vows, uh, which, which Scripture refers to as the New Covenant. Even as the children of Israel back at Mount Sinai exchanged vows with Yehovah there at the foot of Mount Sinai, and the Torah, that what we what some call the Old Covenant or the former Covenant or the Mosaic or Sinaitic Covenant, became that was their vows uh, that they agreed to. They they said we will obey you and and keep your commandments. And he said you will be my God and I will be your people if you obey me and keep my commandments. And there is another covenant coming, a marriage covenant that is going to be ratified, it's going to be formulated at the second coming of Yeshua. And Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 31.31 31 talks about a new or a renewed covenant being established forever between Elohim, Yeshua, and His people. And the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 8.8 8 through 13 quotes this and makes reference to this and the covenant will be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah that's called the new covenant and we are in the process of coming into that new covenant and it says in Hebrews 8 I think it's verse 13 that that old covenant is fading away and it's going to be ratified ratified in a universal sense with the bride of Yeshua when he comes back at his second coming and this will be this covenant, this is like marriage covenants or vows that are exchanged between a man and a woman when they get married. This spiritual covenant uh, is, is going to cement the love relationship between Jehovah and His people, which will last for an eternity. And eventually, together, they will dwell in the new Jerusalem, which will be literally a heaven on earth. So, uh, the Bible from Genesis to uh, chapter 1, all the way to the book of Revelation, which we have uh, covered that ground just in this brief introduction, is that love story that starts in back in Genesis uh, 2, there in a garden, a garden paradise called the Garden of Eden, with, creator, with the Creator and, and, and a man and his wife, Eve, Adam and Eve. And this story starts there, and then it ends this time in a city garden. A city garden called the New Jerusalem. 
there at the described in the last two chapters of the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. And here it involves an eternal marital relationship between Yehovah and his people. Now the tabernacle of Moses outlines this story from beginning to end. And that's why we want to take another look at the tabernacle of Moses and go back in just like we're looking at a diamond and looking at the beauty of this giant diamond and turning it in all of its facets. You know, if you were a jeweler and you had studied uh, precious stones and you were an expert, you would look at that diamond and you would see as the light's hitting it from different angles all the beauty and the, the you know, whatever all the aspects of uh, of a diamond are that that gives the gives its 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 uh, sparkling beauty, and so we're going to look at the tabernacle again, and this time we are going to as we're exploring the concept of of the the, the love story this love story which the Bible is is talks about, and how we're going to show how it's in literally embodied or, or um, contained within the, f the four walls of the tabernacle. And so I call this part the tabernacle, the saint, and the seven stages of the biblical wedding. The seven stages of the biblical wedding. Now, there, there is a... If you study all the examples, or many of the examples in the Bible, of how uh, the ancient... Israelite and Jewish people um, approached marriage. You will see there are steps that were, <coughs> pardon me, that are were taken in the in certain customs and rituals that that occurred in the ancient Jewish or biblical Hebrew. A wedding ceremony and when you put them all together and I've written about this it's on our website um, you will see um, there are basically seven different steps and as I began to study this many years ago I began to see that these seven steps relate to the seven stations in the tabernacle of Moses and this is a revelation that Yehovah gave me many years ago, and I've written about it. Uh, I have study guides on our website. You can go and get the study guide on the Tabernacle of Moses, and I have some other studies where I outline these things. So we want to briefly go through this right now and look at the seven stages of the biblical wedding and compare that with the seven stations in the Tabernacle of Moses so that we will have a better understanding of Yehovah's plan of salvation as revealed in the Tabernacle. And how this relates to his plan, Yehovah's plan to marry redeemed Israel, that's the saints, who love him and keep his commandments, uh, to marry his saints at his second coming. Now this is only one possible way of understanding this complex subject. I'm not saying I have all the knowledge or understanding. I'm sure the next time I make a video uh, I will have learned a few more things and maybe have to change some things. But this is the understanding that I have after studying this subject for, for a better part of 10 years. And, uh, and we, see, we see that, that um, the numbers 7 and 8 figure prominently in this scenario. Of course, most of you know that seven is the biblical number for a perfect completion, while, while eight is the number of new beginnings or infinity. So let's jump into this, and I have uh, basically eight points I want to go through, but actually I'm going to start with point zero. Uh, and this is actually... Um, it's not one of the steps in the biblical wedding, but it is a precursor step that needs to be mentioned. And I call this step intent, or in the wilderness. In the ancient Hebraic wedding, obviously a groom and a bride see each other for the first time. They're not married. They, they haven't started any, any of the process toward marriage. But they see each other for the first time. Interest is sparked and they begin to quote-unquote fall in love. And this is, a, this is a, uh, I call this in the wilderness, and you'll understand what I mean. Well, we see that Yehovah Elohim fell in love with Israel when he saw her lost and abandoned in the wilderness. Or, um, or the wilderness of her existence, you might say, in a metaphorical sense. And 
Ezekiel 16, 4 through 14 talks about that. I would encourage you to go back and read that. It's a quick synopsis of Yehovah's falling in love with Israel when she was a, as a baby, abandoned, unwashed, um, neglected, uh, and dying in the wilderness, and he found her. And that's a picture of Egypt in or Israel in Egypt, and he brought her out. And so this process, when we look at the tabernacle, this process begins in the wilderness outside the courtyard walls of the tabernacle. So this wilderness that was outside, remember the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness when he, when Yehovah commanded them to build this tabernacle out there in the middle of the desert. So the desert is a, is a metaphor for, for, for human beings in, being lost spiritually, without salvation, uh, being in the world, being under the control of the devil, being abandoned uh, prior to their conversion, prior to hearing the gospel message. And similarly, the tabernacle is a metaphor for salvation. For when you come into the tabernacle, you come in in a saved state, and it represents redemption and conversion from going from a, a dirty state, as we've talked about in other videos, um, an impure, unclean, unsaved state, literally going into a, a state where you have a relationship with the creator of the universe by putting away sin, by learning to walk in holiness and righteousness, and by obeying him and keeping his commandments. So the, the tabernacle is, is really a picture of this process where you come in and you're, you're saved, you get saved outside as we shall see outside the tabernacle, and you come in kind of dirty. I mean, you're, you have imputed righteousness, you're, 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 you're ritually clean, but you still have a lot of crud inside of you, and you go through the process as you go through into the tabernacle, enter through the outer courtyard gate, and then you go through all the various steps in the tabernacle, um, eventually coming to the Holy of Holies which is a picture of the throne room of Elohim, where the glory cloud resides. And that, by the time one gets to that point, they are in a pure state, ritually and literally, spiritually speaking, and in a place of oneness and relationship and purity and holiness. And the rudiments of the world have been broken off, and the mind is no longer under the control of the, uh, that is, the, the spirit of man, and the soul of man are no longer under the control of the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, which causes, leads people into sin and away from Elohim. It's a wonderful picture here when you understand this. So, this is a picture of uh, being out in the wilderness is a picture of being lost and alone and separated from Elohim. And when, when, when we hear the message of the gospel, as Paul talks about in Romans 10, 14, 18, we are drawn to Yeshua the Messiah. And so when you're out in the wilderness, you, all, you see this, you see this, in this in this gray, bleak wilderness, you see this, the Israelites would have seen this tabernacle out there as a, in a stark contrast against the bleak, gray, monochromatic um, wilderness. And they would have seen this white curtain, la, a linen curtain, about seven and a half feet tall around the outside of the tabernacle. And the, the door of that curtain would have been multicolored. Four colors. White, red, blue and purple, or the red might be more like a crimson. And this, these colors relate to the four Gospels. This is the door into the tabernacle, and it relates to Yeshua, the Messiah who is the door to salvation. And those four colors speak to the four major aspects of Yeshua, who He is. The white being His purity, sinlessness. Blue, the fact that he originated came from heaven. Crimson, the fact that he died for our sins as a man. Man is, uh, is, is made out of the red clay of the earth. And, and so it's a picture of his humanity and the fact that he had blood and he died and redeemed us by his blood from our sins. And the fourth color is purple, that he is the king. That's the, that's the regnal or the royal color of kingship. He is the king from heaven and he's coming and he's going to rule as the king of kings on this earth. 
So these four colors in the, in the four Gospels, each of the four Gospels address a different aspect of Yeshua. Uh, in, in, these four, in these four ways. So one sees, here's the gospel message, and they see this beautiful multicolored door, and they are attracted to what's behind the door. And that's the attraction of the gospel message to those who are being called and who will humble themselves and hear the, the message and respond and say, I do to Jehovah. So that's, that's Point number zero. Now let's get to point number one in the seven stages of the biblical wedding. The next step is the redemption. Redemption. Redemption is a is a Hebraic way of saying salvation. And um, there we are at this point. The individual is still outside the tabernacle, and you cannot just go into the tabernacle in an unclean state. If you are covered with filth and ritual impurity or been defiled by sin, by death, uh, or whatever, you cannot go into the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites could not go into the tabernacle unless they were clean. If they were unclean and they went in there, they were killed. It was a death penalty. So a, an unsaved person can't just go into the tabernacle. You get saved outside of the tabernacle. And that's where the altar of the red heifer is. Now, in this, the first step in the Jewish wedding, or the, the Hebraic wedding, <clears throat> is uh, after, the, after the young man has seen uh, a young Israelite maiden, There, wet my whistle. <clears throat> um, and he's attracted to her. The first thing he has to do is he comes to the maid's father, the maiden's father. And he, he brings a price called a dowry. And so he presents this to the father and he says, you know, um, I'm willing to lay my life down for your daughter if you will give your daughter's hand to me in marriage. I will, and he lists, he says, this is what I will do for your daughter. And the father at this point can accept or reject a young man's offer. Well, this Yeshua did for his spiritual bride. He laid his life down. He gave of himself. He gave that which was the most valuable. He gave of himself. He laid his life down. And to atone at the cross, uh, and, and he, he, because of his great love for his bride. Now, outside the tabernacle was the, um, was the altar of the red heifer. And the priests and others had to cleanse themselves and become ritually clean before they could come into the tabernacle. Well, interestingly enough, in the time of Yeshua, the altar of the red heifer was outside the temple walls of Jerusalem. In fact, it was outside the city gates. It was up on the, it was up on the side of, of the Mount of Olives. And I believe that this is actually where Yeshua was crucified. And this is a picture of, uh, of Yeshua's death outside the city of Jerusalem at, at Golgotha. And this would have occurred on Passover. In fact, we read in Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 13, <clears throat> where it says that Yeshua was crucified outside the city. And if you put several scriptures together there from the book of Hebrews, you see that there's an there's a implication that the red heifer is a picture of that, the red heifer altar. So we see that the man willing to lay his life down for the bride, <clears throat> or his bride-to-be, is a picture of Yeshua laying his life down for us at the altar of the red heifer outside the city to save us. Just like Yeshua found Israel and was willing to take her in when she was out in the wilderness. And so the bride's price, price I see is a picture of redemption and is a picture of Yeshua dying on the cross. Now, the second step in the biblical Hebraic wedding is acceptance. And this is a picture of the altar of the sacrifice just inside the, that multicolored gate of the tabernacle, which was on the outside, uh, uh, the, 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 the tabernacle curtain that surrounded the tabernacle and the gate, the entry gate into the tabernacle courtyard. 
and the altar of sacrifice was just inside that gate in the courtyard. So now we're back showing the next step in the biblical wedding. The young man then presents the maiden after the father has agreed to give the young maiden's hand in marriage, his daughter's hand in marriage to the young man. The young man and the young man has laid down this price, this great price, this dowry. The young man then presents to this his bride to be. He takes, he pours a glass, pours a bottle of wine into a glass. He drinks from it, and then he gives her that wine, that glass of wine from which he has drunk, and he gives it to her. And if she drinks, then in Hebraic custom, this was her accepting his marriage proposal. And um, this is called the cup of acceptance. This is the first cup. There's two cups in the biblical Jewish wedding, and this is the first one. This is the cup that, that initiates their betrothal. The second cup comes later, and, and this is called, this is the cup that they do when they finalize their marriage um, at the, what we call the nuptials, or the nisuim. This first part of the Jewish wedding is called the erusin, E-R-U-S-I-N. The second one, the second phase of the Jewish wedding um, is the uh, nisuin, N-I-S-U, nisu, uh, I, nisuin, I-N, I think it is. Anyway, and so the first stage is the betrothal, and the second stage is the nuptials. Uh, we, we would call it the engagement and then the wedding itself. And between these two major phases of the, of the Jewish wedding, there are seven steps which we are going through right now. We're still in the betrothal stage here at step number two. So this is called the cup of acceptance and is the third cup of the Passover Seder, which is, all, which is called the cup of redemption. You see the concept of redemption, acceptance. Even though I've broken into two steps here, they're all related to one another. And so after she drinks from the cup, the betrothal is legally established. She's legally married to him, although they're not cohabiting yet. But she is legally married to him, and if she goes out and has adultery or fornicates, uh, that if she has sex with, with another man while they're betrothed, it's considered um, adultery. In fact, that's what what uh, Joseph and Mary, they were betrothed, they were not living together, they were traveling together, uh, along with uh, many others who were traveling to Jerusalem, uh, well, in this case, to Bethlehem, um, for the census, and probably the Feast of Tabernacles, too, in the fall of the year. But they were not living together uh, as man and wife, sexually, uh, in that sense. And that's why, when she be Mary became pregnant, uh, Joseph uh, thought about putting her away because he felt that she had had relations, uh, um, illicit relations, for which would be called adultery, even though they they had not consummated their 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 wedding yet. Um, so there there gives you a little bit of insight into that. So here we see um, after she drinks from the cup, the betrothal is legally established, and believers drink of this cup and eat of the unleavened bread on the evening portion of Passover on the 15th day of the first month. Uh, that's on the evening of the Passover Seder, which also happens to overlap into the first high Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread. So the altar sacrifice inside the tabernacle is a picture, is a picture of this, as is the Christian communion ritual. Interestingly enough, there in the altar of sacrifice inside the tabernacle, they, they would not only offer up sacrifices, which is a picture of Yeshua dying on the cross as well, um, but they would also bake unleavened bread and eat it, and they would pour out wine libations there on the altar. So you have the blood, or the, the blood, the wine, the bread, all the symbols are there. And then they would also eat uh, some of the meat offerings. It was like a barbecue also. So here's a picture again of eating the flesh and drinking the blood metaphorically of Yeshua. So that is step two. Step three in the biblical Jewish wedding or Hebraic wedding is <clears throat> is um, what I call set-apartness or holiness. 
um, and this, the bronze laver, which is the next thing you come to in the tabernacle after the altar sacrifice, is the um, is a, is is a picture of this. So after the young man's proposal is accepted by the young maiden and they the betrothal is established, the young man returns to his father's house to build a house, a mansion. Um, for his betrothed bride, where they are going to live once they are cohabiting. And meanwhile, the bride remains in her father's house and prepares herself for her wedding day. First of all, she takes a ritual cleansing bath or an immersion um, called a mikvah. Actually, it's at a mikvah. It's called a tevila or immersion at a mikvah, a gathering of waters. And that's to signify that she has become ritually clean and totally set apart for her groom to the exclusion of all other would-be suitors. So she's no longer shopping around, so to speak, for a potential mate. She has found her mate and she is now going to consecrate herself and live a consecrated life waiting, preparing herself for her bridegroom to be coming back after he has prepared a place for them to live. He has no reason to build a house until he has a wife to to um, inhabit that house, and that's why he's he's now going now that he has a he has a betrothed bride. He's going back to prepare his house for her. So she has accepted the groom and the terms of the marriage agreement or ketuba. That's the Hebrew word for that. And now she awaits the return of her bridegroom on the wedding day, or that would be the 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 second phase of the Jewish wedding called the nuptials or the or the uh, arrows uh, the Nisuin, where they where they uh, conclude the, the wedding ceremony. So this um, for the ancient Israelites, this occurred when they accepted Jehovah's uh, marriage proposal um, and covenant terms at Mount Sinai, and they said, "I do" three times. Um, once in Exodus 19 and twice, I believe it's in Exodus 24. And there they, they said, I do. And he laid out the terms and they, and they, uh, Moses was a mediator and they, they, oh, they married, yes, chapter 24 of Exodus. And there they married Elohim. Now in ancient Israel, you know, not all the types and shadows fit up perfectly. Ancient Israel, in a sense, was, um, Well, they, 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 between Passover and Pentecost is when the betrothal and the marriage was completed. So there was a little time period there, as there is a time period between when the, when the young man um, betrothed his, his bride-to-be or his bride, and, and then when he comes back for her. Uh, to to conclude the marriage ceremony, so when we we see this is pictured by the bronze laver in the tabernacle where the priests were ritually cleaned, and this is a picture of baptism for the remission of sins in the believer's life, as uh, Romans six three through six talks about. So here the bride, as she's waiting for her bridegroom to come, she 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 washes ritually gets cleaned and this is a picture of baptism for the remission of sins now water is a metaphorical hebraism for the word of elohim uh, matthew ephesians 5 26 talks about the washing of the water of the word and and um this is something that um uh, this this kind of solidifies uh, a believer's marriage covenant or ketubah the, that is the word of Elohim. They they agree to follow it and submit to it, and and they they allow themselves to be washed in it, and they die to their old man, and they're now set apart totally f for and totally devoted to their their bridegroom. Uh, now the last high Sabbath day of unleavened bread. The Feast of Hagah Matzot pictures this, for it is on this day that Israel came through the Red Sea after having left Egypt, and they were baptized, if you will, 
in the Red Sea. In fact, Paul makes an allusion or makes a reference to that in 1 Corinthians 10.2 where he says, They were baptized unto Moses. As an example for us, they're cleansed in the Red Sea. Red is a picture of the blood of Yeshua. And salt, salt water, again, is a, is a picture of cleansing. So this idea of cleansing is very, figures very prominently in the crossing of the Red Sea. And of course, at the same time, they had already put the leavening out of their house, as is commanded for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for that week-long biblical feast celebration. And leavening in the Bible is, in most cases, a, a, a metaphor for sin. And so putting leavening out of our houses is a picture of putting leavening out of, or sin, and repenting of, and putting sin out of our, uh, of our spiritual lives totally obeying our Creator and our Master and preparing ourselves for our Bridegroom, living in a sin-free state. Hallelujah. That's the third step. Now the fourth step in the Hebraic Biblical wedding is what I call separation and consecration. And up to this point, we, we've come through the gate of the outer courtyard. We come, well, first of all, we started the, the red heifer altar outside the courtyard, and then we came in to, the, to that multicolored door. Then we came in to the, first came to the altar sacrifice, then to the bronze laver. And now we are ready to go into the sanctuary itself, the tent or the tabernacle itself. And so we step through the tabernacle, into the door of the tabernacle. And the first thing we come to on the, on the, um, on our left hand side would, have be, would be the menorah, the seven branch candelabra, the menorah which most of you know what that looks like. So after cleansing herself, the betrothed bride prepares for the return of the groom from, her father, from his father's house. So while the groom is away building their home, their mansion, the bride leave, lives a set-apart, consecrated life by keeping herself away from other lovers, from all idolatry, from anything that would take her away from her loved one. And we too are to be living our lives only for Yeshua, living set apart lives, wholly separate from the world, the flesh, and the devil, consecrated to Him, totally obedient to Him, uh, casting down every vain imagination and every high thing that exalts itself in our minds against Him, and taking a captive to the mind, the will, the, w the emotions, the, the word, the spirit of Yehovah, Elohim, and Yeshua, His Son. So, when the children of Israel accepted um, Elohim's marital covenantal terms, they vowed to be faithful and obedient to Him. He said, if you obey me and keep my commandments, and you don't turn to false gods, the gods of Egypt or the gods of the Canaanites, uh, but you remain faithful and keep my commandments, I will be your God and you will be my people, and I will bless you and protect you and keep you. And they said, I do. They agreed to those terms. Well, as you know the sad story, it wasn't very long after that that they were worshipping at the golden calf. But that's another story. But at least initially they promised to be faithful to Elohim. Well, in the tabernacle, the, the menorah is a picture of the spiritual light of truth, of Torah truth, and the spirit of Elohim. Remember, it has seven branches. Seven, each one had a, had a light on it. A candle. In fact, I've got a menorah here. Let me get this down from my shelf. And this, this has candles in it. Uh, it normally wouldn't have had candles. It would have had uh, wicks in these cups here. And they would have um, burned uh, oil, put oil in these cups and wicks. This is a very small one made out of um, copper tubing. But this is what a menorah uh, looked like. And, and it's similar, except the one in the tabernacle would have been made of pure gold. And so the menorah is a picture of a believer living a consecrated life. Um, it's a beautiful picture. The seven, I believe that when a, when a believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, well, I don't, it's what the Bible teaches, they are going to manifest, manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit, as Galatians 5 talks about. And they're going to manifest the gifts of the Spirit, as 1 Corinthians 14 talks about. 
they're going to be walking a spirit-led and a spirit-filled and a spirit-empowered life. And they're going to be like that menorah. That was the only light in the tabernacle. And it, when you get seven candles burning, it's pretty bright. And that light reflected out. If they left the door open, it would reflect and it would probably form a beautiful glow coming out of the tabernacle door if they left the door open uh, into the, out of the, from the tabernacle into the courtyard. Well, that speaks about the believer. The born-again believer, when they are lit by the fire of the Holy Spirit, as happened on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down on the people there in the upper room and, and, and literally lit them on fire, so to speak, when the tongues of fire came down on them, when we are lit on the with the fire of the Holy Spirit, we are going to be like a light on a hill, like a menorah. In fact, the menorah is the is the symbol that's used for the believers and for the church. We see that in Matthew or in Revelation, uh, chapter uh, was it uh, two, uh, one? I think, and certainly I think it's two and three where it talks about the seven churches, and they are the, they are a seven branched menorah, and. And so, this is what we are to be doing. And when this bride was living a life consecrated only to her bridegroom, she was going to be an example of fidelity and chastity and purity. Because she was adhering to her covenantal agreements that she had made, the vows that she exchanged with her beloved. Even as the children of Israel were expected to do, when they made a covenantal agreement with Elohim, and as we are expected to do, when we commit to follow Yeshua, the Messiah, our bridegroom. Now let's move quickly into step number five, preparation, regathering, and reunion. And this takes us to the next a station in the tabernacle of Moses. If you would have walked in the tabernacle, this one would have been on the right side, and that's the table of showbread. And there... At this point, the groom has finalized his mansion. He has finished his mansion. The, they're building a house for his wife. And he's getting ready to come back for his bride now. And his, in the meanwhile, his bride back at her father's house has been putting on the wedding robes. She's filled her lamp with oil because it's dark. And he, she doesn't know when he's going to come. He might come in the middle of the night. So she needs to have, she needs to have a... Um, uh, a candle. In fact, um, let me show you this. Where is it here? I'll get it. This is what this is what the candle would have looked like. A little, uh, little. This is actually this here is about two thousand years old. This is an actual. You can see this in the camera right here. This is a Herodian lamp uh, from Israel, um, part of my antiquities collection. But she would have ha had a lamp similar to this. Uh, fill with oil and actually this is not the uh, let me show you the exact one that's a replica uh, the exact one hang on uh, where is it yeah this actually here I'm taking it out of a box this is the one I, from Israel that there was a replica this is actually um, this is very this, is, this actually here is a you can see it, it's very small, like a little miniature flashlight, but this would have been filled with oil, and this would have been, uh, she would have had the wick coming out of the end here, and th this would have given her light. It's not much light, but she would have had this filled with oil, and she would have had it ready to go. Carefully put this back in the box, and keep it up here, because this is really very precious. That's that's over 2,000 years old there, that particular lamp. Uh, no kidding. Uh, it, it was, in fact, it's never been used. It was dug up out of the earth and it's in pristine condition. Um, anyway, so she would have had her lamp ready. She would have trimmed the wick on there. So when she lit it, it would have been burning brightly. And so she's back preparing her, gar her, her robes, putting um, oil in her lamp, getting her wick trimmed, and, and because she doesn't know which day or hour he's going to come back. Well, I believe that this is, a, and, 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 then, and then when she hears the sound of the bridegroom coming, she hears the sound of the shofar. Oh, I got a shofar around here. Oh, I don't know which one am I going to pick? Let's take this one. She hears the sound of the shofar, you know, like. 
she would have heard that in the distance and she would have gotten herself ready, awakened if she was asleep, got her garments on and gone out to meet him and his entourage as they're coming to, to, um, to gather her. And this, and, and there'd be a happy reunion, and then they would go back to their father's, her father, or his father's house for a marriage supper. So this here is the preparation, regathering, reunion, and I believe this, the, the table of showbread is a picture of that, because on there you have 12 unleavened loaves of bread. They're unleavened, which means, leavening is a picture of sin, means, which means they're in their unleavened state, or pure state and the 12 represents the 12 tribes of Israel and this speaks of the regathering of the 12 tribes of Israel they're in fellowship in oneness in unity in a pure unleavened state and they're in the presence of Elohim the table of showbread literally it's um, Shulchan HaPanaim or the, the, the table of the faces or the in the face of Elohim. It's this picture of communion and a picture of table fellowship of people coming together and I believe that's a picture of the bride and the bridegroom coming together or the bridegroom coming together in the presence or the face of the Almighty. Yehovah Yeshua, the bridegroom. And so this is a picture of the bride and the bridegroom coming together getting ready to have a meal the wedding supper of the lamb and I believe that this it happens in the fall uh, it's a picture of the Yom Teruah or the day of trumpets or the day of the shofar blast depending on how you translate the word Teruah and Yeshua's parable of the ten virgins is a picture is a poetic picture of this some of the virgins were prepared and some of them weren't the wise ones had oil in their lamps and their wicks trimmed and the others didn't. Now they were all sleeping, but now it's time for us all to awake all Israelites, all redeemed, born again, blood-bought Israelites, redeemed Israelites, to awake out of spiritual slumber and get ready to meet the bridegroom, Yeshua the Messiah, for His coming is imminent. And Yeshua, uh, Yom Teru is a picture of this momentous, long-awaited occurrence, which I believe is when the resurrection of the righteous saints will occur, to where they will meet Him in the air as He is returning, and be given glorified bodies as He is returning to this earth. Now, the next step, uh, point or step number six is the re return of the wedding party to the bridegroom's house and I believe this is a picture of the altar of incense and this relates to uh, the the sixth feast which is Yom or the seventh fifth fifth feast which is Yom Kippur so at this time the the bride and the bridegroom have she's gone out to meet him in the air or in this case she's gone out to meet him for the saints is meeting Yeshua in the air at the resurrection where they will receive their glorified bodies and um, and now the wedding party returns the reunited bride and bridegroom and their entourage return to the bridegroom's father's house where they prepare for the marriage feast which will initiate then the married life uh, together. Um, so at, at, at this time, you know, when Yeshua, I believe that when this is a picture of the second coming of Yeshua, who will come to gather his bride. And as he's coming to gather his bride at his second coming, we read in the book of Revelation that he is going to come as a warrior on a, on a white horse, a stallion, a war stallion, and he's going to destroy. Not only is he going to gather his bride, get his bride, but he's going to destroy her enemies. Those who her, were her would-be persecutors or contenders, those who were trying to draw her away from him, those that were trying to be uh, pretend that they were him and they were not the, the 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 false antichrist the false messiahs all of those that worldwide system called babylon the great that's been trying to counterfeit the things of elohim from time immemorial and draw god's people away and enslave god's people even as the children of israel were enslaved by pharaoh a picture of satan there back in egypt well 
the beast, the false prophet, the Antichrist, whoever, they are all under the power of Satan. And Satan has been trying to establish his old world order called Babylon the Great. It goes back to his rebellion in the Garden of Eden back in Genesis chapter 3. Or I mean, uh, was that 2? 3. And, um, um, we'll get it right. I don't like to put out false information. I think it's chapter 3 here. Let me, yes, chapter 3. I had a, had a when I'm doing this off the top of my head, sometimes I, I uh, get ahead of my brain. But anyway, and so we see that Yeshua is going to come back and he's going to, you know, Bible says, vengeance is, vengeance is mine, saith Jehovah, I will repay. Well, he's going to destroy Babylon the Great. And we read about that in the book of Revelation and pour out great judgments upon the enemies of his bride. And then, at that time then, uh, this, uh, this occurs... Um, during Yom Kippur, and I believe that this is a picture of the Day of Atonement at the altar of incense, which is a when the bride and bridegroom come together. It's going to be a time of great intimacy and a time of of love, and she's going to be worshiping him. The altar of the incense there in front of the veil that went to the Holy of Holies was a place of worship and prayer and adoration and praise and incense going up representing the prayers of the saints and I believe that that's going to be her, the bride's response when she sees Yeshua she's just kind of like worship and praise and adoration and her heart is going to be tenderized like never before to be ready to enter into the Holy of Holies, a picture of the wedding chambers, the chuppah the matrimonial bed, the throne room of Elohim, the place of eternal cohabitation and oneness forever and ever between the bride and the bridegroom. Now point number seven is the consummation of the marriage and the wedding feast. And I believe that the Ark of the Covenant is a picture of this. So after the young, young couple now returns to the father's house, and she, he then carries her across the threshold into the mansion that he has built for his beloved. And it is there that the marriage is consummated in the, in the, in the inner chambers of, the, of, of their bedroom. And, um, and the wedding, the, the, the young couple begins to live together. And the wedding feast occurs. And typically in ancient times it would last for seven days. And I believe that the Holy of Holies, or there in the tabernacle, or the Kadosh HaKadoshim in Hebrew, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant was, is a prophetic picture of this. And it points us to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the thousand year long celebration referred to as the Millennium or the Messianic Age in Hebraic literature. Um, during this time, Yeshua and the Bridegroom will rule over this earth. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and her along with him, his wife, the glorified bride of Yeshua, as kings and priests, helping him to rule over this earth, as it says in several places in the book of Revelation. Now we are just skimming over the top of the waves. Each of these points could be broken down, and we could, we could go into a lot more detail, and we have in other videos, and we will continue to do so as we are able but this is just a quick overview hopefully it'll get your wheels spinning and your mind thinking along more Hebraic paradigms so that you will understand that the message of the gospel the message of redemption is so much more um, detailed and such a much more beautiful picture than anything you have probably understood up to this point. And hopefully this will help you to understand the Bible in a fuller sense. So you like that jeweler, you can look at the diamond called the Bible, or in this case specifically the tabernacle, and turn it around and look at it in its many facets and look at it with a more of a, um, with a, with a lens, a uh, magnifying lens, and look in there and see the, the beauty of it all. Now we have one more point here, which we will conclude this teaching with, and that's point number eight. Remember I said at the beginning, uh, seven and eight, uh, the numbers seven and eight in the Bible are very significant. Seven is the number of completion or perfection, and eight is the number of new beginnings or e eternity. And I see eight as the, um, the final step, and I call this, um, it's really not part of the wedding ceremony itself, but just like point number zero wasn't part of it, we had seven points in between. 
but we have the cover of the book the front cover and the back cover, if you will, and point number zero out in the wilderness before they met, or at the time they met, and then point number eight are the covers of the book. Uh, and this book ends in, like all good stories, and they lived happily ever after. The, you know, the proverbial um, prince and princess, or king and his queen, uh, living happily ever after, after going through a lot of difficulties in, in between. Um, Anyway, so this is the life, what I call point number eight, life happily ever after. And this is eight, this is new beginnings, or for eternity. This is the, and they lived happily ever after part of the story. So this I see is the glory cloud over the ark. A lot of people don't include the glory cloud over the ark. But the glory cloud was the only thing, it was part of the tabernacle, but it was the only thing that was not made by human hands. All the other things in the tabernacle were made by human hands. And that, I believe, is a picture of a man living on this earth. Everything, living in a physical existence. And yet, there's going to come a time when man is not going to be, you know, the new heaven, the old earth is going to be burned up. And the old heavens, the book of Revelation talks about, and as some places elsewhere in the prophets, in Isaiah and so forth. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And I believe that these are going to be a spiritual dimension. It's going to be literally like heaven on earth. And this is a the, the glory cloud over the top of the ark, the pillar of fire by day, or by night, and the cloud by day, as well as the Shekinah, or that glowing aura that 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 was that filled the that, that glowed and lit up the inside of the holy hole is, is a picture of that that represents the very presence it wasn't represent it was the presence of Elohim on this earth they're living among his people abiding with them tabernacling with them there in the holy of holies in the tabernacle of Moses so the young couple would start married life together well Yeshua and his bride and they would hopefully live happily ever after well Yeshua and his bride will live together in their new home, new home, the paradise garden city of the new Jerusalem. And in Hebrew that's called Olam Haba, uh, eternity. And I believe that the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret, now Shemini Atzeret is the last biblical high holy day. You have, um, um, or you know, loosely speaking, you have Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, the spring feast, is point to the first coming of Yeshua. And in the fall, you have um, uh, trumpets, or Yom, Yom Teruah, atonement, tabernacles, feast of tabernacles, and Shemini Atzeret. Shemini Atzeret is a separate feast, or a separate day, or a separate, separate holiday from Sukkot. It, it's called the eighth day because you have seven days of Sukkot, and then you have the final eighth day of uh, eighth day, which is a separate celebration. And more emphasis needs to be given to this day, but I believe it's a picture of the New Jerusalem and life everlasting, living in an eternal spiritual state in the glory cloud of New Jerusalem. The bride and the bridegroom living forever and ever, and all their enemies will be destroyed. All the wicked will be ashes under the feet of the righteous, they will have been burned up in the lake of fire by now. So here we, here it is, all laid out before you, the tabernacle of Moses, looking at it from a little different perspective, once again, in this case, looking at it from the perspective of the seven steps of the biblical Jewish wedding and showing how the tabernacle is a giant love story between Elohim and and his bride, Yeshua HaMashiach, the bridegroom, and the saints who love Yeshua and keep his commandments. It is the outline in the tabernacle of the story. And in this brief, about one hour and ten minute, or one hour and nine minute teaching, we have literally covered, gone from the book of Revelation, chapter one, all the way through to the end of the very last chapter in the book of Revelation. And that story, wonderfully, is contained in the tabernacle of Moses. Hallelujah. And to be to Yehovah Elohim be all the glory. Amen. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near. He is near. He is near. Yeshu Hashem Behimatzov Kerabu. Oh, oh, oh. 